Hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar this evening titled Physical Therapy Considerations for the Management of X-Linked Adrenal Leukodystrophy. We are just waiting for a few, few more people to join the webinar. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. I'm Kelly Mianin. I'm the Executive Director of ALD Connect. And it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers tonight. Um, so first we'll hear from Nisha Bandaru. Nisha is completing her third year of the Doctor of Physical Therapy program at Boston University. She is an asymptomatic woman with ALD and has a 21-year-old brother who was diagnosed with ALD in 2015. Nisha has developed a passion for neurologic physical therapy throughout her experiences and is interested in helping patients improve their quality of life. And Nisha is joined today by one of our ALD experts, Jen Keller. Um, Jen is a physical therapist at the Kennedy Krieger Institute in Baltimore. As a reminder, ALD Connect does not recommend or endorse any specific physician treatments, procedures, or products, even though they may be mentioned on this webinar. This webinar is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. If you or a family member are ill or suspect that you or a family member are ill, please seek professional medical attention immediately. And if you have any questions uh, while we are hearing from Nisha, please feel free to put those in the chat and we'll do our best to answer those at the end. And now I'll turn it over to Nisha, thank you. All right, well, first I wanted to thank you guys all for having me and for taking time out of your evening for this webinar. My name is Nisha Bondaru and I am a third year Boston University Doctor of Physical Therapy student. And this presentation is called Physical Therapy Considerations for the Management of X-Linked Adrenal Leukodystrophy and the Role of Physical Therapy in ALD and AMN. So this talk is gonna be tailored more towards patients, their families and caretakers to discuss the benefits of physical therapy. And for the purposes of this presentation, I'm gonna to refer to the condition as ALD. As we know, there are four phenotypes of X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy, ranging from the male childhood cerebral type, adult adrenomyeloneuropathy with potential cerebral involvement, and adult females with ALD. And these concepts could apply to all of them as the clinical presentation and timeline is variable. A little bit about me. Um, like I mentioned, I'm in my third year of the DPT program at Boston University. I got my bachelor's from UNC Chapel Hill in exercise science with a minor in neuroscience. This past summer, I was able to do a clinical affiliation in an outpatient neuro rehab clinic in Baltimore, and it was truly one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. And I also have a 21-year-old brother named Ganesh with XALD, the childhood cerebral phenotype, and we also have a family history of women with ALD. So my sister and I are both asymptomatic women with ALD, while my mom and grandmother are both mildly symptomatic. So the purpose of this presentation really traces back to when my brother was first diagnosed. My family, especially my parents, experienced a lot of confusion and frustration and didn't really know a lot about physical therapy, you know, what it was, what it entailed, or how it could even help. And there was a lot of switching between physical therapists and not really knowing what the best things to do were. And my parents eventually found some neurologic PTs and home PTs who were able to help navigate some of the issues that were being faced. Um, but for me personally, I was actually considering physical therapy while I was in college, but it was really my brother being diagnosed with ALD that pushed me to want to explore it further. A lot of people may not know that there are actually different specialties in physical therapy, but as a whole, PTs are movement experts who can diagnose and treat individuals of all ages who have injuries, illnesses, and other health-related conditions. And because there are so many specialties for this diagnosis, you want to make sure that you have somebody who specializes in neuro or pediatrics, just depending on what makes sense for you. The goal is to really keep people as active as they can for as long as possible. And you want to maintain a certain level of activity and as much function as you can throughout the duration of your life, especially with ALD. 
So it's really important to build a relationship with your physical therapist early on. Having somebody who knows you and has been with you throughout can be helpful because they know your story and can be more cognizant of changes. And in an ideal world, you would start working with the physical therapist early on and establish a relationship and collaboratively set that plan of care. And then once you have that foundation set, you can establish what is considered a dental model of care and create a plan to follow up with your PT every couple of months or as you start to experience changes that are affecting your functionality. The idea is to kind of think about it as how you go to the dentist twice a year to maintain your oral health and prevent problems. You can think of physical therapy in the same way. So you would touch point and check in and they can do some baseline assessments and see where you are and then try to catch things that may be a problem, but you may not notice it yet or they're not truly impacting you yet. It can definitely be challenging finding the right physical therapist for you. My family has definitely had struggles with it. So I included a screenshot um, with a link and a QR code for the APTA database for finding a PT. You can definitely use word of mouth and your own research, but this is just a quick way to narrow the search. So like I mentioned, you want to find somebody who specializes in neurologic PT and or pediatrics, just depending on what makes sense for you. And you can filter based on location, setting, specialty, and it'll populate a list of potential PTs who you can look into. Aside from the different specialties, there are also different settings for physical therapists. So you can know that you will pretty much find a PT anywhere that you can access some type of medical care. And for ALD, the primary areas that you would be looking into would be outpatient, home PT, and school PT. So I'm going to focus on those. Outpatient versus home PT with outpatient centers, you probably have more options. The ones that are affiliated with the hospital may be more likely to have a physical therapist that specializes in neurologic PT, while freestanding clinics tend to be based more in orthopedics. And outpatient clinics also have a variety of equipment, so you can get as creative as you want because you have access to the whole gym. And you'd likely be going to outpatient PT if you have the ability to get there, while with home PT, you'd be considering this probably later in the diagnosis when you're having more difficulties leaving your house. But the best part about home PT is that they're able to help you navigate the issues that you're having in the exact setting that you're having them in because they are in your home environment. And often home PT is regionally based, so you may have less of a choice, but you wanna make sure to be asking the question if they have somebody who is comfortable with neurologic diagnoses. School PT is more so for the pediatric population. And the purpose of the school PT is to make sure that a child is able to access their education and navigate their school environments. So a PT can help maintain and change positions in the classroom. They can assist with navigating the halls and stairs safely, assisting in the restroom, navigating the cafeteria and things along those lines. And you may require more physical therapy outside of school, but the real goal here is to make sure that your child can safe, safely and effectively access their education. And sometimes the process to navigate this can be fairly difficult and it's largely dependent on the school system. So now we've talked about what physical therapy is and how to find a PT. We're gonna dive a little bit into how a PT can help you navigate the progression of ALD. ALD and AMN, as we know, presents differently for everybody. There is a lot of variability, but physical therapy can have benefits for every presentation of ALD, including the cerebral phenotype. And over time, you may start to notice changes in your body related to stiffness, spasticity, poor coordination, global weakness, pain, impaired sensation, and slower movements. And this can eventually lead to difficulties with walking, with balance, getting in and out of chairs, maintaining your position and posture, and being able to perform your day-to-day -day activities. And down the road, these can make it difficult for you to participate in your academics, your career and social lives, and even make it difficult for you to perform your own self-care activities. When you're first diagnosed, you wanna start creating your healthcare team. And that usually consists of your PCP, any specialty physicians such as genetics and neurology, rehab doctors such as physical therapists and occupational therapists, orthotists, et cetera, 
Um, you want to make sure that PT is involved in the process because they are the movement specialists and can help you maintain functionality for as long as possible and also be consulted on how to navigate your world as the condition progresses and certain things become more difficult. For simplicity's sake, we're going to break it down into three phases. We'll start with early in the diagnosis, go to progressed stages, and then advanced stages. Early on in the diagnosis, you may not even notice that things are hard or holding you back. And this is actually a critical point because this is when you should really start finding people to help you through this journey so they can see you at your baseline. And the goal here is to take advantage of what you do have and build muscle and endurance to help maintain functionality and mobility. So you wanna be focused on strengthening, on stretching, on balance work and aerobic activity. So we're gonna to touch a little bit on each of those things now, but before that, I just want to also mention that um, PTs can also help prevent and manage any of the secondary things that you could develop along the way, such as contractures and fatigue. Starting off with aerobic activity, this can help with building your endurance, preventing fatigue, improving cardiovascular health, in addition to just having mental and global health benefits. If you are only able to do one thing, this is the most important one because it's where you're gonna get the most bang for your buck. And there are so many ways that you can get aerobic activity in. So finding something that works for you, just do that. So some examples could be um, treadmill exercise, going for walks, hiking, cycling, and swimming. And generally you wanna get about 20 to 30 minutes in four to five times a week, but do what you're able to. Um, you may consider doing shorter bouts of exercise throughout the day if you find those longer ones to be too much. Now, going into strengthening, it's also really important to be doing at this time because it can help with all the things that are mentioned here. So your balance, your walking, daily activities, um, bone and joint health, and helping to prevent that stiffness. And with contractures, the muscles can become stiffer and lose their motion over time. And strengthening can actually help combat some of that. We'll also get uh, more into balance in depth soon, but in terms of strengthening, core strength is important to help maintain balance because with a strong core, you don't have to um, use your arms and legs as much to keep steady. Also your hip flexors, so the muscles at the front of your hip and your hip extensors, so the muscles at the back of your hip are more likely to become weaker. So some simple functional exercises that you can do are standing up from a chair that's at a lower height um, to work your lower half of your body or pushing up from a chair using your arms to work your upper body. Now, those examples could be too easy, too difficult, or just right for you right now. So working with your physical therapist will help you have an exercise program that's specifically tailored to you. Stretching can help with decreasing muscle tightness, decreasing pain, and preventing loss of motion which can occur with that weakness, decreased activity and spasticity. If you can tolerate it, you would be holding your stretches for about 30 to 40 seconds, three to four times. And one example of a stretch would be to place your feet against a wall or a padded head or footboard to put your ankles in a neutral position to help correct that turning down of your foot that can happen with ALD. So for those of you who were at the conference, we were able to hear some of the presenters talk a bit about balance and how postural sway could potentially be used as an outcome measure for ALD because difficulty with balance is one of the most common presentations for ALD. And working on your static and dynamic balance activities could help with preventing falls, maintaining safety and performing daily activities like walking around your home and community, getting dressed, showering, and some people with ALD and other neurologic diagnoses have found joy in doing things such as yoga and Tai Chi. So those are options that you can consider exploring or something simple that you could do in your home could be getting on an uneven surface like a foam pad or a pillow or a folded towel and balancing in different stances. So you could do your single leg stance, you could do tandem stance or narrow stance. And when doing so, you can stand in a corner of a room so you have walls on each side that you can hold on to or kind of have to catch you if you feel unsteady. Next, we're gonna talk about the progressed stages of ALD 
And some of the things that we're gonna cover are exercise, safety strategies, and navigating your environment. As the disease progresses, you still wanna be continuing your exercises as much as you can tolerate with any necessary modifications. So your physical therapist can change parts of your exercise program to reflect your current state and needs. And it's really important to remember to try and be gracious with yourself throughout this process, because at this point, movement is gonna to start to become more difficult. You may have to start considering safety strategies, such as using durable medical equipment and orthotics, and really just starting to relearn how to navigate your world. Physical therapists can help with brainstorming and implementing some safety strategies so you aren't more at risk for falls. For example, um, I know a couple of you are avid wall surfers, and while that may be a successful strategy at home, you don't wanna become dependent on that as it may actually end up limiting your ability to leave the home. So a PT can help with understanding what types of equipment you may need such as figuring out the best device to use if you need assistance with walking at home and in the community. Adaptive exercise is also something that you can consider at this point if you feel like you won't be as safe in activities that you typically participate in. Some examples of adaptive exercise can come in the form of adaptive gyms, wheelchair sports like basketball and yoga or adaptive yoga. At the ALD Connect meeting this November, we were able to hear about the I Am Able Foundation, which was started by Chris Cag, who is a former US Marine who was diagnosed with AMN. And the goal of this organization is to help provide opportunities and funding for people with physical, cognitive, or behavioral challenges to participate in adaptive sports and group fitness programs. And their mission is to provide everybody with the opportunity to be more active, to enjoy the benefits of physical fitness and spend time outdoors and doing things that they previously thought that they couldn't. If this sounds at all interesting to you, I would definitely check them out because the work that they're doing is incredible. So I actually included a QR code that leads to a brochure that Chris has sent me for you guys. So I'll pause here for a second in case anybody would like to scan it. You also may wanna start considering durable medical equipment. And these are ordered by a healthcare provider to be used to assist with your daily activities. And some examples of those could include assistive devices and mobility aids, orthotics, bath chairs, grab bars in the shower, dressing aids and toilet seats. PTs can really help play a role in identifying which resources are best for you and then train you to effectively use them. Accessing, accessing DME can come in many forms. You can go through Medicare and Medicaid coverage. You can go through private insurance, nonprofit or state assistance, local pharmacies, medical supply shops. But PTs are one of the healthcare providers who can write letters of medical necessity to help justify to insurance why they should be covering a certain piece of equipment for you. As we know, everybody has a different story and experience with how their ALD presents. When you start to consider assistive devices is very individualized. If you're noticing that you're starting to trip or fall, that's probably an indication that it's time to have a discussion with your PT about potential options. But luckily there is equipment that can be helpful for pretty much everything. Some of the most common types of assistive devices include canes, crutches, rolling walkers, rollators, mobility scooters, manual wheelchairs, and power wheelchairs. And there are pros and cons to each of these, so it's important to work with your PT to make sure that you're using the best option for you. Getting into spasticity management and bracing. So spasticity is essentially when a muscle becomes tight and stiff due to increased muscle tone and weakness, and this can impede with your normal functioning. As mentioned before, daily stretching of your muscles can help keep them at their typical length and help manage that tightness so you can move through as much range as possible. And bracing can be used to keep the muscles at their full length as well. There are a variety of different brace types and your physical therapist can help you figure out which one is the best one for you based on where you are in your journey. If you are using braces and orthotics, it's important for you to be wearing them as prescribed by your healthcare team. 
And you also want to be making sure that it's comfortable for you and that you're able to check your skin to make sure that there's no breakdown. As a condition becomes more advanced, all of the previous things mentioned still apply, but more considerations do need to be taken in order for you to access your environment safely. Your PT can help you restructure your home exercise program to meet your current needs, discuss what types of durable medical equipment you may need, help figure out what home modifications potentially need to be made, and start the process of wheelchair planning if that hasn't already been done. And if you are looking to become involved in exercise outside of PT and in the community, you could start to consider adaptive exercises here as well. There also may start to be a higher reliance on your family and caretakers. So your PT can help educate and train those individuals and provide helpful resources on how to move forward. So some final thoughts. Um, everybody's journey is different, but this is a general framework of how PT can help you throughout the course of your diagnosis. Sometimes it may take a while to find somebody who is the best fit for you and your family, and sometimes that person may change. So start as early as you can because having a physical therapist can really help you throughout that whole journey. And something that I also wanted to mention is this picture on the right. It is a picture from when my brother Ganesh graduated high school. When he was first diagnosed, we didn't know if he was gonna be able to graduate high school. So I just wanted to bring that picture to everybody's attention because we were very proud of him and really wanna thank um, our healthcare team for supporting him throughout this process as well. So some thank yous, I have a lot. Um, first, thank you to ALD Connect and Kelly Mietinen and Felicity Emerson for helping me organize and coordinate this project to Dr. Brian Wishart and Jen Keller for all of their insight and contributions. Um, my mentor, Dr. Lisa Brown from Boston University, she's been instrumental in this process for me. And Dr. Florian Eichler and Dr. Chris Joseph for the insight that they gave me throughout this project as well. And all the patients, families, caretakers, advocates, researchers, and healthcare professionals in the ALD Connect community. And last but not least, my family. So I included a bunch of resources in here if anybody's interested. And with that, um, are there any questions? Stop. Thanks, Nisha. It looks like we do have some questions coming in. Um, the first one is, can physical therapy help with bowel and or bladder issues? Yes, they can. Um, there are actually some physical therapists who specialize in pelvic floor health. So it'd be um, a good idea to be connecting with them while some neurologic PTs also are able to um, handle that. All right. Um, next question is, are you aware of any DME swaps or discounts for PT care? Um, I personally am not. Jen, do you have any idea about that? Um, I know of some in Maryland. So if you're in Maryland, <laughs> I, I know of possible ways to get access to care. Um, like equipment closets are good, like is a good like sort of search term to use um, if you're looking in your area, um, because a lot of like uh, churches and local communities have uh, have like equipment closets where you can either loan equipment or you can um, trade in equipment like that you're no longer using for something that you need now. So I would recommend starting there. Great. Um, another question, um, it says my, my son is an advanced ALD patient. Is there a way that PT can help with scoliosis? Yeah, so um, a lot of PTs are can be generalists, and a lot of all the PTs are um, trained in musculoskeletal conditions. So definitely, PTs can help with scoliosis. Right, looks like we're having an issue with the chat, so working to get that fixed. Um, another question though, my son is six years old with ALD. He is not having any physical limitations at the moment. Would you recommend starting PT two times a year now to document the baseline? Can you ask that question one more time? It cut off. Yep. Yep. 
My son is six years old with ALD. He is not having any physical limitations at the moment. Would you recommend starting PT two times a year now to document a baseline? I would just having somebody who has seen him at baseline and also taking advantage of what he does have now can help with that preservation and um, kind of setting him up for success throughout the um, journey. Okay. Um, and a similar question, is it beneficial to see a physical therapist proactively before symptoms start? I think, in my opinion, that's more of a personal decision based on what, you know, what works for your schedule. Um, I think it would be just making sure that you're physically active is the main priority. Um, Jen, what would you say? Um, I think, right. I think it is your choice. I think there are some really good things about it. I think in some ways, like it'd be good for the whole world to have a PT that, you know, is your like, like your primary care doctor, because I think throughout life, we um, develop habits that are bad habits and things like that, that can kind of, um, you know, like cause more problems down the line, but a PT can even help you establish a good wellness program now that meets all those criteria that Nisha talked about, like a good strength training program and a good aerobic program and making sure that you're meeting all of those things so that um, you're kind of set up for being in the best position to handle any changes um, that happen, you know, as you move on, so. Great, thank you. Um, looks like a few more questions coming in. Um, what are the Medicare rules about home physical therapy progress? We have had issues with discontinued coverage due to progress. Um, as far as I'm aware, I believe that you need to have a physician um, kind of like verify or like certify that you are homebound and that you require home PT. That's probably as much as I know about the Medicare rules for home PT in particular. Um, I know that they have certain requirements that need to be met. Jen, anything to add on that one? Um, I guess it depends on now if um, telehealth being much more prevalent, that might be another option depending on how much needs you have. So if it's a problem with being able to get to PT, possibly telehealth is a more accessible means in, by which to get um, physical therapy without having to leave your house. Um, I don't know if that addresses that question exactly, but that is another option. Okay, great, thanks. Um, let's see, there's some lots of questions coming in. So this one says, I have back pain and knee pain um, and foot pain. Where to begin? Is there one part to work on first that might help the others? Can you say that one more time? Yep. I have back pain, knee pain, and foot pain. Where to begin? Is there one part to work on first that might help the others? That answer, I, it depends. Um, that answer is very variable. The lower extremities, so your legs are a closed chain system. So if you're having um, issues in your hip, knee, or ankle, working on one of those can affect the other. And sometimes the pain can be referred from your back. So that would be something that your PT would be figuring out in your evaluation. Jen, you agree? Okay. I agree. Great. Um, so this one says, in your experience or through your research and connections with this topic, is a physical therapy referral considered standard practice in ALD? at the time of diagnosis, or is this something patients and families have to seek out on their own? Yeah, so um, in my family's experience, it was something that we had to seek out on our own. Um, some physicians or whoever um, is on their healthcare team may recommend PT as a standard of care, while some may not really know about the condition or know that it's something that would be helpful. So I would say right now, it's not necessarily standard of care, but I would argue that it should be. I think at the specialty clinics that are, um, you know, throughout the country, that uh, PT at time of evaluation is pretty standard. Um, but as the, you know, the local community might not be that familiar with that practice. Um, 
I think also in that way, it requires a little bit of advocating in order to educate. Unfortunately, you have to educate often your providers when you have some, you know, a rare dis diagnosis that they might not be as familiar with in order to, you know, um, help have them help you decide, you know, if it's appropriate at right at the time of diagnosis or not. So. Mm -hmm. Um, Nisha, there's a question about what treatments your brother has received. Um, my parents would definitely be able to answer that question better than I can. But um, right now, I know he's on, he's had Botox, he's had baclofen. He's been in PT for probably about eight years now. Definitely took a while to um, find a neurologic PT. He has a variety of braces and orthotics, um, and so he does daily PT currently. Um, I'm not, that's kind of the gist of it. Okay, thanks for sharing. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned orthotics. There's a question that says, can you tell me about orthotics um, that will help with ankle slash leg contractures and how to get access to them? How can they get access? Sure. Yeah, there are um, a bunch of different types of orthotics. There is one called um, an AFO, so an ankle foot orthoses, and those come with a bunch of different modifications and specialty or specializations based on what makes sense for you. If you're walking, if you're not walking, how often you're going to be um, mobile when you're using them. So there, that would be a question for your PT as to what would be best for you. And also your PT or PCP can put you in contact with an orthotist to get fitted for one if um, your insurance would cover it. All right. Um, this question, maybe Jen, you might be able to answer. It says, I live in Maryland. Would you recommend starting the baseline physical therapy for my son at KKI or would a private PT be more appropriate? Um, yeah, I'd like, I'll let Jen answer that since she's KKI. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, either one is fine, um, especially if they don't have any symptoms. I think to get a baseline evaluation, that's fine. It, um, I guess it depends on how much education you need as well on just if you want education on, you know, um, uh, you know, what to look for and those kinds of things, then I guess that's another, you know, option as well. But um we have both. There's a lot of physical therapists like there are in Boston. There's a lot in Maryland that are very good expertise. So I wouldn't limit yourself to, to just one place, but we are, we definitely are, an, you know, an expert center in, in ALD. So um, that's an opportunity you may have. So. Great. Thank you. Um, a few more. Uh, for advanced ALD, protecting lungs is important. How can physical therapy help prevent congestion? Is there a best practice? So I didn't specifically look into um, the pulmonary side of things, but PTs can um, are trained in cardiopulmonary techniques. So that's something that can be addressed with your PT. Um, it does come up in neurologic diagnoses. So that would be a point to reach out to somebody who specializes in um, neurologic diagnoses. Hi, Dr. Wishart. Thank you so much for joining. Yeah, sorry, I'm late. Kids okay. are feeling great. Just going through some questions. Um, so the next one is, um, is it possible with ALD to lose weight while seeing a physical therapist weekly, or is it better to find adaptive sports options? Um, I guess that depends on what your goal is for PT um, or just in general. So if your goal is to be losing weight, then I would probably consider the adaptive sports options because um, like that kind of falls more into personal training than physical therapy. If I'm understanding the question correctly, while um, the PT option is more so for maintaining your health. Anything to add, Jen, Dr. Wishart? Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a great question. You know, when we think about um, PT, when we think about adaptive sports, um, I think that you know exactly as as Nisha was talking about. There's there's sort of that goal based aspect of things. 
Um, I think about our, our PT, especially as patients are getting older and, and that sort of thing is being very um, goal oriented at times. And, and what are what are we really working on in there versus adaptive sports can be much more generalized and, and a great way of sort of having more of a community type um, regular activity based. And it might be something that's, you know, part. I think they, they both may be part of it, but the adaptive sports may be much more in line with sort of your your general lifestyle and um maintaining a physical active life um to, to keep up with things great thank you um would you recommend digital pt programs or are in-person ones better um this participant has seen virtual programs where you wear sensors and a therapist evaluates you but not sure if that would be as helpful yeah, so um, with digital PT programs, I think it really comes down to um, your scheduling, your, what you, is accessible to you. If you're having difficulty, you know, leaving the house, I would probably go, you could go to home PT or do more digital programs. Um, I always would advocate for in-person, honestly, because it's invaluable being able to have your PT, like be able to move you and have their hands on you and kind of figure out what's going on. Um, but I do know, I believe, Jen, you have some experience with sensors, right? Uh, yeah, so we have a couple of studies that we're running. Um, I don't know if that's where you would have seen it, but um, where we use um, some uh, accelerometer sensors that we put on the on the white waist and on the feet, and we measure balance and walking. And in some ways, um, that has an advantage if you don't, do, if it's not available in the clinic and we do send it to your home to do it. Um, that's a way to get some really good quantitative measures that we might not be able to get, you know, just by observation. So that's like a little more high tech than a typical telehealth um, visit. Um, so I don't know if that's exactly what we maybe the question is about. But in addition to that, I think it's kind of, I guess I've become an advocate in, during the pandemic of a little bit of both. It's really nice as an outpatient therapist to get to see what your home environment is like and how you're performing in that environment and be able to tailor what it is that you want to do to meet those objectives as well. So I think it all depends on your goals. And, um, you know, if if both are available, maybe, uh, uh, you know, starting with one in person and one at a telehealth and see which is most beneficial to you, depending on what your needs are, I think is a is a good option. Um, I would also say you really should check with insurance because sometimes they're covered. I mean, it seems like they're be mostly being covered at this time, but um, but there's changes to that often. So. You talked a little bit about goals. There's a question um, here that says, what are ways you can measure if PT is working? Yeah, so that's actually a really good question because um, there's a couple different ways to see if it's working, but because this diagnosis is a degenerative one, sometimes the outcome measures that PTs are using may not always show improvements, but it may show that um, what is like the regression is being is like a little slower than what would be expected. Um, so there's different outcome measures that your PT could use and different tests and measurements that are um, carried out, such as range of motion, strength assessments, um, walking and balance measurements. So your PT would be keeping track of all of those things on your chart. So whenever you do come in, they're able to assess you and see if there have been any changes or if things are kind of stagnant or whatnot. Um, I think I'll just add to that. I think that's really true. I think it depends on if you're getting like an annual assessment where you might see some sort of decline versus if you're getting like a bout of physical therapy of like, you know, eight to 12 weeks, I don't think that we would necessarily expect to see decline. We should expect to see some improvement and it might be a matter of you have to, um, the therapist has to be a little creative about what measures they use. So, you know, we often push on your arm or your leg to see how strong you are. And that's um, kind of a gross measure of your strength. But we did a strength training program with people and we used a instrument to measure the amount of strength that the person could resist. And we saw in about, in 12 weeks, we saw about five to six pounds of strength change with um, consistent effort that I might not be able to pick up with my hands. And you also might not notice it as an improvement. And I often advocate that that then means that it's a great 
way to have that kind of small measurement so you know that what you're doing is working so that you keep working at it until you get to the point where you know you know you yourself know you feel better but i do think it is it's a mixture of both it's these like kind of smaller measures so that we know if what we're doing for you is is working in some way but then also you have to um you know uh, you get to weigh in and say whether or not it's beneficial or you're meeting those goals that you meant to. So it's, it's a, it's a joint effort. Yeah, I would, I would second that. I would completely agree. I think there's certain things that we utilize on the clinical side, but at the end of the day, there's certain things that you should be going in working for, and, and you'll be able to tell if you're making benefit um, and, and what's helpful and what's, what's not necessarily. And ideally you're seeing certain things become easier and that sort of thing. Okay, lots of questions. Um, for advanced patients, is there a best practice that PT can help with spasm? Um, I would um, say that that's usually more medically managed because um, with PT, the main goal is like preventing spasms and or preventing contractures and kind of creating a plan to um, with like stretching to alleviate some of the pain that you're feeling. In terms of spasms, particularly, I believe that is more medical management. Yeah, there's, I mean, you know, there's a, a, quite a few things. I think when we think about spasms, you know, it's kind of a, I think, a broad term. And I think about spasms as being more of that acute onset, um, that kind of quick tightening up, and you're having pain associated with it. You know, you can also think about tone in terms of just that general spasticity. Um, and that type of thing, that, that general spasticity can be really incredibly helped with PT and stretching programs and that sort of thing, bracing, nighttime stretching. There's certainly, night, you know, medications and injections and other things that can be helpful. And then there are some other things out there from um, uh, like the vibration suits and um, shockwave therapy and other things that, that are done by some of our therapists that have been shown to be helpful um on smaller studies that are that are starting to be utilized a bit more um best practice is not really identified it's really individualized to each patient um so it is one of those things that you do need to sort of work with um you know a physician and, and, a, and a therapist that that know your your case and and can work through it with you all right next question is can neuro PT be done for patients who are not quite lucid. Um, that is, the, the PT comes in and moves legs for the patient or assists with movement. I would say yes. Um, just making sure that there is um, like an advocate in the room, what, like a caretaker in the room with the patient, just to make sure that the person feels comfortable is really important because you don't want to have somebody that if somebody's not lucid, you don't want to have another person come in there that they are not as familiar with. So I'm thinking more in terms of like a psychological perspective, but I say neuro PT is still um, good for people who aren't, um, who may have any good cognitive deficits for sure. All right, um, this one says, I'm a caregiver. Can you direct me to a resource showing stretching exercises at home? Um, I can probably find one. I don't have one like easily accessible right now, but, um, that would be also be something that your PT would be able to do if you have one. Yeah. I don't necessarily have one off the top of my head and sorry, just for the last one, you know, yeah, there's, there's certainly, I think it depends on what, you know, what kind of communication you have with the patient, um, regarding, that sort of thing, and if there's a way for them to communicate what's going on, but there's certainly a role for therapy in our in our more advanced cases. I agree. Mm -hmm. Sometimes being moved around can be helpful in general, but um, especially for positioning and turning and things like that. Um, uh, the uh, for the stretching program, sometimes I refer people to um, Multiple Sclerosis um, Society, the NMSS Society, and the Can Do MS um, programs. They both offer a lot of um, resources for patients and for caregivers and supporting patients. So it's a good place to start. Great. 
Um, this one says, I suffer from severe neuropathy pain and recently read about spinal cord stimulation. Does anyone know of any success with the HFX system? Oh, yeah, very detailed. I'd have to look up exactly which one that is. Yeah, I haven't heard of it or worked with it, so I'm not the best person to ask about that. Okay, that's, that's okay. We can always try to follow up after. Um, can you talk specifically about the type of PT that can be done for bowel issues associated with AMN? Yeah, so um, I'm not specifically a pelvic floor PT, um, but that is something that I would probably refer out to them. Um, Jen, I don't know if you have any insight on that particularly. Well, a lot of the bowel and bladder problems can also be, it's a good combination thing. Basically in our clinic, it's rehab medicine and therapy that both kind of address this in unison. So, um, I mean, from a medical standpoint, there's, you know, medications and, um, like, a, but also just from a combined effort program, there's, you know, um, uh, we usually talk about like, a bowel and bladder program so that you're, you know, avoiding attempting every two hours, assuming that, I mean, there's like neurological effects too. So that has to be addressed. But if from like a general wellness perspective, um, you know, there's voiding on a schedule and then there's, but also we usually start with people just um, giving us a record of what their current problems are. Um, but then physical activity and standing and positioning and things like that can actually help with, um, maintaining bladder and bowel function. Um, and then actually also respiratory like support and exercise can also be effective. So it, it's sort of, um, I know as we sort of give this answer always as it depends, but there are a lot of different ways in which therapy kind of um, supports a healthier, you know, bladder and bowel function. Um, in addition to like a pelvic floor, more, you know, detailed, you know, training kind of um, program as well. Yeah, standing. If you can make sure that we're standing, the, the benefits for the bowel with just standing on its own are, are endless. And then um, there's nothing on that one. So the HFX system is the high frequency system. It's um, relatively focused at pain. I'll tell you, I don't use it. Um, I've, I have not prescribed to anybody or sent to anybody that way, and I don't have any patients that that do utilize it. So I don't really know necessarily um i think it, the problem is I, I do primarily work on with pediatrics and it's not um approved in that in that world all right um this one says have there been any studies on the use of cbd and or thc to treat spasticity interested in the panel thoughts on the use of alternative medicines if traditional medicines are not effective Um, I didn't. I didn't see any um, specific evidence that, um, or strong evidence for CBD and THC for spasticity. I'm um, not sure if the other, you guys have seen it. So, there, so when it was originally sort of allowed to be prescribed, and, and where it is right now, it is one of the indications um, for uh, medical marijuana is spasticity, chronic pain, um, or options for it. I certainly have people clinically, um, you know, from a research basis, it's been hard to get good research on this because it's still a federally regulated drug. Um, so much of the studies are not, you know, well blinded and that sort of thing. Um, from a, you know, patients that have used it, I think I've seen some people that have had a lot of great effect. Um, I, there was just a study that said a lot of this may be related to placebo effect. Um, I think it's hard to say it's out there. I think starting, you know, with uh, low dosage, um, talking to a provider that is well informed about this and knows, you know, there's a lot of different components to it, whether it's the combination and the and the ratio between CBD and THC, you know, CBD is definitely on the safer side. THC, you're going to have um, uh, more risks and, and more, you know, potential interactions with there are certain interactions with um, bleeding risk and other things. So again, I, I would discuss it with um, a provider that knows and that they do, they're out there now. I think as we're getting more legalized, there's a lot more providers that are prescribing um, and well-informed on this. 
Um, I do think that there's there's certainly utility in, in different alternative methods. Um, there's been a, a decent amount of literature in acupuncture and um, that kind of aspect. And I, I do think that there's probably a role in certain settings. Um, I think it just needs to be thoughtfully done and, and recognize that this is, you know, these alternative medications and a lot of the supplements and other things can function just as medications do with different interactions and different types of things. So being thoughtful and, and cautious with it, as we would with any medication, I think is the key. Thanks, Dr. Wishart. Um, next question. If there isn't a neurosavvy PT within driving distance to the patient, what are some of the top things we should stress to the therapist about what ALD and AMN um, does to our bodies so they can best help us? Yeah, so that's actually a really great question because um, when I was kind of actually using the database myself, just trying to plug in different locations, there were definitely some where you didn't have a lot of neurologic PTs available. So what I would stress to the PT is to focus on um, balance training, strengthening. So for any weakness that can come up, balance training, um, assessing your gait. So walking in different scenarios and on uneven surfaces and um, developing a stretching program to get your range of, to make sure that your range of motion is as good as it can be for as long as possible. Jen and Dr. Richard, do you have any other ideas? I would go on with that. I am. Um... If you email me, I have like a bunch of stuff. I always email to a therapist to say, this is what, you know, I, I know about AMN and I'm happy to pass that information on. Um, in addition to that, like you can also email like any of the authors on any papers about AMN and ask for your, pa for their papers and they will send you a copy. So um, I'm not trying to, I've just been doing this a long time. So one of our papers is just on strength, balance, sensation, walking in AMN and across the spectrum of the disease. And I usually think that's pretty helpful to just give therapists so that they don't have to go looking for it themselves. And they can, you can just say, you know, this might be helpful to, to what you're trying to address. So um, that's a great idea. We'll be asking you for a copy of your paper. Um, have you found any specific diets or supplements um, to be helpful with ALD symptoms, specifically bladder and bowel issues and restless leg? So this is probably a question that I can't really fully answer. It's without this um, outside of the scope of PT for the most part. And um, I know my brother specifically is on a lot of different supplements um, and it's what works for him. So um, I don't think I can specifically answer this question. Yeah, yeah, I would say, you know, I don't think that there's anything that's tried and true and out there and I agree, it's pretty unique. I, I would say when I think about bowel issues, sleep issues, um, restless leg type symptoms um, across more than just ALD, but um, magnesium can be really helpful. Um, it kind of does a slew of things and, and bowel and sleep and anxiety and calm and all of that kind of stuff all fall within that. It has had some discussions of being helpful in sort of peripheral nerve issues and that sort of thing. Um, typically, um, let's see, the, the psychiatrist I worked with that um, kind of got me Looking at this deeper, um, recommended magnesium glycinate, but there's lots of ways of getting it in. Epsom salt baths and stuff actually will absorb quite a bit. Um, so if you're able to to work that into your daily routine, that can be really helpful too. Um, but you can do up to four, you know, well you can 400 twice a day can be a good dose. But um, they usually say that the only way you're going to overdose on magnesium is if you drown in it, and literally like in an Epsom salt bath. So it's not the magnesium. <laughs> All right. Um, my 28-year-old son has a lot of pain, but can't really talk to me. Does it come from the spasms or contractures? Um, it, this, uh, oh. Sorry, I lost the question. He says it's pain, um, and she's wondering what might be going on. Um, it could be either. 
um, a lot of the times those do go hand in hand. So um, that's probably the best answer to be able to give you um, as someone who hasn't seen your son. Um, but yeah, I think it really could go hand in hand with the, either the spasms or the contractures because one can kind of lead into the other. Yeah, it's hard to say. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, so some questions here for um, your contact information, uh, the bibliography. Misha, I don't know if you have access to that QR code, but there was a request to show that again. Mm -hmm. I think for the I Am Able Foundation. Give me one second, I'll pull it. I'm gonna send it in the chat. Um, thank you. Um, and another question here, do you see progressive hand and arm weakness in women with ALD? Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking for the thing right now. Um, you can, um, I know I haven't specifically worked with any women with ALD and um, in terms of my family, we haven't experienced it for the most part, um, but I know in terms of um, men with a men or a, an ALD, they can develop um, hand weakness and contractures in your wrist, specifically like a wrist flexion contracture. So um, I would say, it's possible. Um, the presentation for all of the phenotypes is extremely variable and you kind of almost never really know what you're going to get. But I think it's something that I would be just kind of cognizant of and working on in terms of strengthening if that's something that I'm going to be worried about in the future. Let me see if I, I don't know if you're talking about in girls or in women. Mm -hmm. I would say in women, it's not, I, I mean, I haven't seen it commonly. So I would say that it, we would want to be evaluated to be sure that if there's not something else that's causing it, just because, um, because you have AMN doesn't mean that you can't have something else that, you know, a neck problem or a, you know, a spinal problem or something that is contributing to that. Um, uh, I know that there's some, you know, tremor that is more, that's kind of found in women. I know that there's some dystonia, which is kind of like a, you know, a, like a little altered movement or something. Um, but we, I would not say commonly that I see progressive weakness. Um, uh, it's probably most weakness occurs, um, you know, from your hips down if there's, uh, and yeah, so. Yeah, I, I would agree from the patients that we've seen. I, I think about upper extremity stuff in the adult and like the males more associated with um, like our cerebral form that, that might be a bit more advanced um, for our for even our men and our women that that are specifically more the myelopathy. It really is associated more of like a, a spastic paraplegia and, and in the lower extremities. Um, there are these other aspects of the, the women's phenotype that come with the spastic dysphonia and other tremors and head titubation and other things that that are not really well described but um i would not just chalk that up to ald and leave it under un, unexplored um i think there's more there's more that needs to be done when you're when you see that um let me know if this qr code works for you guys thank you I think we've gotten through most of the questions. I'll just give it a minute or two to see if there's any others that pop up. I'll give everyone a minute to link to, link to the I Am Able Foundation brochure. Thank you for coming through for all the presenters and panelists and experts. Like that's about it. So thank you everyone for joining. This has been wonderful. Um, we will do our best to get um, some links out to some of these resources and the recording posted soon. Um, and you can always reach out, reach out to us if you have any other questions. So thank you so much. Thanks for joining, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. And thanks. Sorry again, guys. This is, this is great. <laughs>